So today I want to talk with you about Scala 3 History Features and Review. Um, a, li a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a senior software engineer. Um, I've been working with Scala for five years. I also have experience with Java and Kotlin. Um, I'm also a functional programming enthusiast and on open source contributor and libraries author, uh, Cat Saga and Zia Saga. Uh, but today we are not going to be talking about me. Uh, we are going to talk about Scala. And um, first thing uh, I want to talk with you is a little uh, brief uh, disclaimer. Uh, first of all, I'm not a Scala 3 guru. I'm just enthusiastic about uh, new features. Um, I watched presentations on the topic, uh, read articles and docs, um, and played with uh, the features of Scala 3. Um, I know some of you folks are Scala experts here, uh, but be aware that this presentation is uh, lightweight. It's designed specifically uh, to be given on Java uh, community events, so there will be no uh, type level hardcore stuff. Um, so this is going to be like um, an overview mainly of the most anticipated features uh, accordingly to some researches. Okay, so our agenda for today, uh, we're gonna um, start uh, with talking about Scala history. Uh, then we will talk about um, new features of Scala. And uh, finally, we will shed some light on the migration process. Okay, uh, let's start with the history. How did we get there? So uh, Scala project started uh, in 2001 uh, in uh, Sw uh, Swiss, Sweden University, EPFL, uh, by Mar Martin Oderski, Professor Martin Oderski and his students. Um, they started this uh, project, Scala, to prove that object-oriented programming and functional programming uh, fusion can exist and work well, works well. So the first release of Scala uh, happened on 2004. Then in 2006, uh, they released uh, Scala 2. And until now, we've seen only releases of the second branch of Scala. So the last one came out in 2019, uh, Scala 2.13. Uh, and this year, finally, finally, they released Scala 3 uh, in March. So uh, the history behind uh, Scala 3 uh, is that uh, the development started actually eight years ago. So uh, Scala 3 compiler is eight years in development. Um, and uh, it started as a project with name Dati. We'll see uh, why um, this is uh, the name of the project soon. Um, so and this year, um, so the Dati is actually the name for the Scala 3 compiler. And this year, uh, Dati was renamed to Scala 3. Uh, Dati name is derived from the uh, dot calculus. Uh, what's dot calculus? Dot stands for dependent object types. Um, dot calculus is actually, uh, yeah, you see uh, here is an academic paper released in 2012 by uh, Martin Odersky and his students, uh, mainly Nadami. Uh, that was uh, specifically um, written, it's, it's a formal system. Uh, it was specifically written as a mathematical foundation and groundwork for a new Scala version. Uh, it's a basis for proof to be sound type system. So what's, what is sound type system? Uh, the problem with Scala 2, uh, right now that its type system is unsound, uh, which means that it's possible to write a program in Scala 2 uh, that compiles, uh, it's verified by compiler, uh, it passes all the verification processes, um, but fails uh, in runtime with class cast exceptions with, uh, with some errors uh, regarding um, type conversions. So uh, this should not be possible. This uh, can be possible actually in the system, in the type system that is sound. So that was the initial intention, the initial motivation for the new Scala uh, 3, uh, to prove that its type system can be sound uh, and bulletproof. So yeah, uh, 
The personal take, uh, this is the personal take of Martin Odersky on Scala 2. Uh, he said that, he, uh, that they have tried to come up with the language that is clean as possible, tame so, some of the powers of Scala. So indeed, uh, Scala 2 is so powerful and it's uh, easy, it's very easy to shoot yourself in, in the leg. Uh, and the syntax might have been better in many places. And, uh, and because of that, the learning, steep, uh, the learning curve is steep. Uh, that's a really um, frequent concern from the community that uh, it, it's hard to learn Scala uh, to newbies. So Scala 3 attempts, attempts to solve all of these problems. Let's see how. Um, let's see how Scala 3 uh, copes with that. Um, we'll start looking at um, new features with enums. So this is actually not a new feature for Scala. Uh, in Scala 2, we had enums. Uh, they're implemented like uh, that. Uh, you see the code. Um, you should uh, extend your uh, singleton object uh, in Scala with enumeration. Um, uh, you should extend enumeration uh, abstract uh, class. Uh, and that's how you create uh, enumerations in Scala 2. But the issues with Scala 2 uh, enums is that it, uh, first of all, it's problematic uh, adding of new parameters. Uh, let's say you want to um, populate, for example, your color enumeration with um, hex string parameter. It is doable, uh, but I will show you how it's done. It's, it's unintuitive. It's uh, worse looking than in Java, for example. It's uh, just ugly. Um, so the second flaw is that you're, uh, you will not be able to override and have a different implementations of different enum values. That's also bad. Um, exhaustiveness check uh, is not working in pattern matching expressions for enumerations. And because all of these uh, flaws, uh, they are not really frequently used in Scala code bases. So uh, all this led to Scala enums, en enums not being used. And instead, people would prefer to choose um, ADTs or uh, algebraic data types. Uh, they are implemented in Scala with CLA traits and a bunch of case classes implemented with CLA traits instead of enumerations. Uh, or libraries like enumerator. Well, Scala 3, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, before we go into Scala 3, uh, here you can see how you can actually add a parameter to enumeration in Scala 2. You need to create an internal class that extends an internal class of enumeration in order uh, to create a constructor for uh, enum value that uh, can have a parameter. So in my honest opinion, this is ugly. This is kind of unintuitive. You should spend time to Google that. Um, I don't like it and no one likes, no one likes it. Um, so in Scala 3, they introduced the new keyword, uh, enum, uh, finally, and that allows you to write uh, just a simple enums uh without a boilerplate uh, stuff uh, without some unintuitive uh internal classes you can also add parameters here like this you just uh, add a constructor after your enum name uh, and you just enumerate all of your cases of your enum uh, saying that this case extend uh, your enum uh, type and you can pass uh, a parameter to a constructor of this enum. So this is kind of simplifies things. Um, yeah, uh, and also new enums uh, could be parametrized. That's what's not, uh, that was not possible. I think, I believe in Scala 2 is what, uh, this is, uh, this was not possible uh, to parametrize your enum. Uh, and this allows uh, uh, you to create a generalized, generalized algebraic data types or ADTs that I already mentioned. So 
I believe in Scala 3, uh, we will have a new default way of uh, creating ADTs instead of select traits and bunch of case classes, we will use enums. So like here in the example, is it, this is the implementation of the very basic optional type that we frequently use in Scala with enums. Okay, so that's it about enums. Um, let's talk about next feature. Uh, this is also one of the uh, most anticipated features in Scala 3, the most awaited features, extension methods. So extension methods uh, were, were indeed possible as a pattern of usage of implicit classes or implicit values um, in uh, Scala 2. So uh, what's, uh, what are the extension methods? Um, the extension methods uh, let's say let's say uh, we have a class uh, circle, uh, for example, um, and this class has a bunch of um, parameters like coordinates, radius. Uh, here you see uh, the, this is a case class. The case class means um, that compiler will generate for this class. Uh, Scala compiler will generate for this class a bunch of uh, methods like uh, to string uh, equals hash code. Uh, so this is, should be familiar to you if you use Kotlin, for example, data classes from Kotlin uh, or uh, Java Lombok data annotation. So this is kind of similar functionality to Lombok's um, data annotation. Uh, and it also allows to use case classes values in pattern matching in Scala. So uh, back to extension methods. Um, let's say we can't ch really change this class this uh, class is uh, written in some library maybe or in the dependent project and we don't have access to it. We can't uh, really extend it. Uh, we don't want to extend it. Uh, we just want to add a new method to it, but without uh, changing it, um, just obeying the open closed principle. Um, so in Scala 2, you can implement this by um, using an extension method function. So uh, this is how extension looks like. You create an implicit class circle ops, for example, that will wrap your original class and extend any well, whatever. Um, and in the body of this class, you define the methods you want to extend your original class with. And if you have this implicit class in the scope of your code, so let's say, in scope, you have a circle uh, object, uh, the object of a class circle. If this implicit class is, is in the same scope, you can call an extension method, for example, in this example, circumference on it. Uh, this is magically work because Scala compiler sees that you're trying to call the method this, that doesn't exist on the circle and it will search in implicit scope for any implicit class or implicit conversion uh, that will allow you to call the circumference on the circle. So basically under the hood, uh, the Scala compiler will transform the circle. It will wrap it in the circle ops instance. And this, is, uh, this will allow you to call circumference, but this, is, this magically works for you. So the problem with this pattern is actually, it, that this pattern doesn't concern um, the intention. We want to extend, but this code tells us that this is some implicit class with, that extends any well, like what is this anyway? Like this only concerns mechanism. So in Scala 2, in Scala 3, I'm sorry, they introduce new keyword extension that uh, allows you uh, to write well, extensions uh, without um, having to write this hassle, noisy code with implicit stuff. You don't need to know how it um, works under the hood now. You just, you want to create an extension, you write it. Um, this is kind of cool. And simpl simplifies many things, simplifies reading and reviewing uh, others code. You could, uh, Scala 3 also allows you to create a bunch of extension in one place, uh, like here. Um, this is also um, kind of simplifies 
uh, things uh, because, for example, comparing to Kotlin, where uh, the Kotlin uh, language actually also has uh, this extension methods functionality, but it will not allow you to create uh, a bunch of extension um, binded to a single um, argument. You will need to create a separately one extension and the second extension. But here in Scala, we can, uh, in Scala 3, we can actually uh, define uh, grouped extensions and, or multiple extensions for a single parameter. Okay, um, so this is also a very nice feature, uh, very anticipated. Um, I'm very excited to use it in production. Um, so next feature I want to talk with you is actually a changes in the type system, uh, union and intersection types. So Scala 2 had the compound types functionality and it was replaced in Scala 3 with intersection types. And they also added union types. They should be familiar to you if you use TypeScript, for example, or F sharp. Um, let's see an example. Um, in Scala 2, um, compound types is like a combination, a combination of already existing types. So here you see in line 15, we are creating this compound type by giving a type alias um, for a bunch of existing types that we are gluing together using this with caver. So blogger with the B axis, with the B configuration, this is actually a new type, new compound type that will uh, gather the uh, properties of um, those component types. So this new audit logger type that we are declaring here uh, will have um, all of the same properties that logger or DB access or DB configuration has those log, insert, host, port, port, host methods and values. And this will allow you, allow you to um, substitute uh, any, in any place where you need, for example, logger, you can substitute this, it with audit logger. Uh, instance. So in Scala 3, um, in Scala 3, uh, they added new intersection types. So inter uh, what's the difference between intersection types? First of all, um, the new syntax uh, tells you to use ampersand instead of with keyword. So this is how you glue uh, types together in Scala 3 right, logger and DB access and DB configuration. So, uh, but that's not the most significant change. Uh, the most significant change in how this type works ex exactly. So intersection type in Scala 3 um, is commutative. Uh, what does it mean? So in Scala 2, compound type was not commutative. And it means that Type A with B is not actually the same as type B with A for compiler. Uh, you will uh, run into problems if you will try to substitute the value of A with B with the value of type B with A because they are not compound. This is uh, a very fundamental problem for the uh, language type system. And it was not possible in Scala 2 to fix it like a bug or something. So uh, they come up <laughs> with a whole new uh, Scala compiler. Um, so in Scala 3, so in Scala 3 um, intersection type A and B is the same as B and A. And, and that's what actually really uh, intuitive and expected, right? We don't expect the type that has the same properties from A and B would be different from type B and A that has, well, equal properties. Um, this is uh, very useful for compiler for inheriting types. Um, and they also added a uh, union type. Uh, the union types, uh, union type, uh, it's something like either type, if you're familiar with either. It will, it, it allows you to say that the type of your variable uh, can be either, for example, string or int. So uh, here you see in code the function parse float that accepts value of this union type string uh, and int. So it means that value can be either string or int. 
And in the function body here, we can match this value against the type. So we can say, okay, if it's a string, do this, if it's an int, do that. So this is very useful. This, this is a new feature actually for Scala 3. Uh, it was present um, in languages like TypeScript, for example, for a long time already, uh, but this was really lacking in Scala. Uh, we had to use, um, we had to use things like uh, either uh, wrapper or seal it trade with a bunch of case classes extending it. Um, yeah, so now we don't need to use that to create a simple uh, join of types. Uh, next feature, um, export clauses. Yeah, this feature, well, I cannot say it was top five most anticipated feature, but in my opinion, it's very interesting. Uh, it's very interesting because it's um, a move towards OOP. Uh, it tackles uh, some of the problems uh, of object-oriented design. Uh, the goal of expert cause feature is to ease the pain of composition over inheritance principle. So uh, I believe you're all familiar with this principle uh, of object-oriented design to um, prefer, uh, in many cases, to prefer composition over inheritance, right? So, uh, but there are some um, caveats of using this principle. Let's see uh, what are um, the flaws. Okay, so let's start with the example. Uh, let's say we have a banking system uh, that has a bunch of microservices that we are talking to. And let's say we have uh, written, um, I don't know, or generated, for example, some protobuf clients, client code that will um, talk to uh, other microservices that we need to talk. Uh, and we have this, uh, for example, we have this account API client interface uh, that allows us to talk to account service. And we have this money operation API client interface that allows us to talk to money operation uh, API client. Um, now we, uh, let's say we have a ticket to implement some kind of a facade or kind of a uh, delegation code that will uh, join these two interfaces in one class. So we don't need to uh, pass around like uh, separate um, objects uh, here and there. We will have like one single a point of access to uh, different microservices, right? So um, this is how we can do this, uh, do that. Um, I'm not saying that this is like an ideal facade or ideal solution. It's, it's not, you should, shouldn't probably do it like so, but uh, for our purposes, it's, well, it's okay. Um, so let's say we have created this Ben KPI facade class and we want to delegate um, calls to different methods uh, to those microservices um, clients. Uh, so with bearing in mind composition over inheritance principle, we, uh, we are injecting um, this uh, money operations API client interface and account API client inter interface instance through the constructor to this class, right? And we are extending uh, our interfaces. And now we need to manually write all of this, uh, all of these methods, uh, manually delegate to the appropriate uh, implementations to the appropriate clients. Um, so this is kind of boring. Uh, I mean, um, I think all of you has already uh, seen or uh, did this to your projects uh, somewhere. So um, this is kind of trade-off. You get the flexibility uh, using the composition of our inheritance uh, principle. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, you need to do more handwork uh, because you're not inheriting anything. Um, so Scala 3 introduced this expert feature, which is like uh, an opposite 
for imports. So this basically allows you to, um, well, export uh, all of the methods, all of the values from the objects class that you're exporting from to the current class and objects. So here you see uh, how it's done. You write export, you write your object, and you do it basically, basically like you're importing from the project, but you're well, exporting. So this two instruction will populate this class uh, with the same method that money operation API client or account API client has as final methods. And it will delegate the calls to the appropriate, um, fun, uh, to the appropriate objects. So this will allow you in your code uh, to create this bank API facet and use the same uh, function that you have on both of these um, composed objects, let's say, uh, on the facet. So this is really a similar code to this, uh, but without hassle, uh, without a boilerplate. This is actually a very interesting feature. Um, look into it uh, using it into my uh, code bases. Um, and I'm also interested if you guys know any other language that, that has this kind of uh, feature, uh, give me a shout. Okay, um, next feature, top level definitions. Uh, this is gonna be a really light feature. So uh, in Scala 2, we, we didn't have much, we didn't have the functionality to declare functions on the top level of the file. Uh, we were forced to create a, a so-called package object. For example, to go to the whole, of the, to the whole package. So in this case, um, MK string function will be uh, available uh, in, in the collections util package. Um, but in Scala 3, you don't need to do this. In Scala 3, you just can create in your package, you can create a file, this uh, Scala file, and you can just put a bunch of functions. So this is also um, a simplification, a great simplification for Scala. Uh, next, create, create our applications. It sounds uh, actually it sounds more complicated than it is, uh, because it's basically uh, getting rid of new keyword in Scala. So in Scala three, you don't need to uh, write new keyword when you want to uh, create a new instance of the class. So it was indeed possible in Scala two already. Um, and apply method, uh, static apply method. Um, and if, you, if your class has a static apply method in companion object, you don't need to uh, write new keyword um, to create a new instance of, of that object. So Scala will use this apply uh, factory method to create an object. But uh, it was not available for all classes. It, the supply method was generated, for example, for case classes automatically, but for other classes, it should be um, defined manually. So in Scala 3, it's just generated by default. So by default, you don't need to use a new keyword anymore. Uh, this is a kind of simple change. Also, main method uh, has, um, has some changes. Um, so in Scala to uh, to create the main method, you basically uh, you basically have two options. The first option is looks uh, almost like in Java. Uh, you need to uh, write exactly the same uh, signature method as uh, you see here. Uh, definition main with uh, exactly one um, argument uh, args of array of strings, or you can use var arg. Um, yeah, so the second option was to extend an app interface or trait, uh, and this will uh, generate a main 
main uh, function for you. Uh, but in Scala 3, we have a new method, um, a new method to create um, main. It's a uh, main annotation. If you ascribe a main annotation to your function and it can be top level, you don't need to create a class or a singleton object for it. Um, you can name it just like you want. Uh, you can call it application entry point or application or demo or like whatever. You just tell the compiler that this is a main method with uh, this main annotation. And the compiler will understand that this is a main method, okay? And it will uh, generate all of the code. It will generate this basically. Um, yeah, and also the nice feature of the new method is, is it allows you to um, define exactly what parameters your main method requires without, and you don't need to parse the array of strings uh, manually. Um, this feature is also uh, integrated in IntelliJ IDEA, which is uh, kind of fancy. Uh, if you run, if you try to run the main application your first time from the Scala, uh, from the IntelliJ IDEA, sorry, uh, it will show you this pop-up uh, that will uh, ask you to enter uh, the values for your um, uh, parameters of your main function. So that's kind of cool for uh, newbies and hello world programs. <laughs> I don't know if it will be uh, useful for production, but um, looks looks serious for newbies. Okay, uh, so that's uh, the main uh, changes I wanted to talk with you um, with Scala 3. Actually, Scala 3 has a lot of changes, a lot of new features. Some of the features were deprecated. Some of the features were uh, removed from the language uh, seriously, right? So this, uh, we, we almost can consider Scala 3 as a new language, but it's, but it, it's also more complete and more simple to use, simple to learn, which is good. Um, so other notable changes of Scala 3 are uh, given using instead of implicit. So yeah, Scala had um, a lot of um, syntax uh, around implicit classes, implicit methods, implicit values, implicit parameters. So implicit, 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 implicit. But th they choose to simplify the scene so people will not confuse different implicit syntaxes between each other. Uh, they introduced um, the given and using new keywords. So given, you use this given keyword uh, where you declare an implicit value and you use using a uh, keyword in arguments where, where you want to declare that this uh, function, for example, uses uh, an implicit value or given value from the scope. So this is, we'll, we'll see how it works out. But I believe uh, this this change was really debatable. They spent a lot of time debating how, how they should uh, name their new implicits. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, I guess it will simplify things. Um, opaque type aliases is um, something maybe um, it tries to address uh, some of the same concerns that people have uh, in Java. Um, writing Valhalla project. So to have a uh, lightweight uh, wrappers around uh, other objects, but this is more um, about creating a new types instead of um, lightweight wrappers. So explicit nulls is about, um, explicit nulls is about uh, changing actually uh, the um, type system of Scala. So this is available in Scala 3 as a compiler flag. So you can enable explicit nulls as a compiler flag, and this will um, uh, restrict you from assigning new, null or nullable values to uh, non-nullable values. So uh, this is kind of something similar to Kotlin, right? Um, this will, um, so for example, you will not be able, uh, if you have a, a variable of type string, you will not be able to assign a null to it. It is possible in Scala 2, it is possible by default in Scala 3, but with this option, it will not be possible. 
uh, it will only be possible if you explicitly say that your type of this variable is nullable by using union type that we already uh, had a look at. Uh, so you would write like string or null. That, this will allow you to pass null. Um, match types and dependent function types and kind polymorphism, this is all hardcore, I would say, type level things. Uh, they're very interesting. Um, optional braces, this is very controversial change in my opinion, and not only in my opinion. Uh, this is about dropping um, curly braces from the language. So currently Scout3 allows you to write with curly braces or without like in Python. So yeah, uh, this is uh, about notable changes. So finally, um, I want to talk with you about migration process. So migration process uh, from Scala three to uh, from Scala two. I'm sorry to Scala three. Um, the people from community were really concerned, really afraid that this will be like um, Python two, Python three uh, migration, because uh, Python two, Python three migration, as far as I can tell, uh, for some project, it was a disaster. It was not really very compatible. And um, well, Scala, three, Scala maintainers, um, Martin Oderski and the team, they invest uh, a lot of time uh, to make this uh, transition smooth as possible by um, introducing new intermediate type for compilation unit. So uh, as you probably would guess, Scala 2 compiles directly directly to bytecode like Java, for example. But uh, from Scala version 2.13 uh, and Scala 3, uh, they, com uh, they first compile to the intermediate type called Tasty. Tasty is, um, name is a pun like a dotty, but Tasty means uh, type of uh, abstract syntax tree. So Scala compiler will compile your Scala 2.13 to this, um, type of abstract syntax tree format. And this is the same format the Scala 3, com Scala 3 compiler .e will understand and will be able to use uh, for compilation. So this allows you to, for example, use Scala 2.13 libraries, the libraries that compile, the right compiler for Scala 2.13 in Scala 3 and vice versa. So yeah, this is kind of cool that you can actually use Scala 3 libraries Compile it for Scala 3 in Scala 2.13. Yes. Uh, so uh, runtime and compile time performance uh, is the same as uh, so it, uh, Martin Oderski claims. Uh, and I believe him uh, here. Um, everything that works in Scala 2 also works in Scala 3 with three, actually three exceptions. I won't accept macros, but actually the three exceptions, macros, uh, Scala reflection and Scala compiler plugin. This was done uh, to uh, indeed tame some of the powers of Scala because uh, in Scala 2, you was able to write like basically everything you want, uh, like change the language, uh, like um, the way you want uh, with compiler plugins to uh, interfere in before the compiler will calculate the types to change the syntax. So uh, you can do a lot of th things in Scala 2 with your code, with those compilers and macros. Macros is, is actually also a way to uh, write code. Macros is a code that writes another code in compile time. Um, so it, and it led to many people seeing how this macros and compiler plugins were used in the libraries and they start pulling those techniques, very, very obscure techniques into the production code. And this led to, well, situation where this kind of smart guy, smart ass guy, leave the company, uh, and leave, um, the company, the code base that is pretty much uh, unreadable, unmaintainable 
and obscure with this matrices and different techniques. So uh, this was the drive uh, to restrict uh, matrices, to restrict scalar reflection and um, compiler plugins. So, uh, but they introduced new functionality to replace matrices, new matrices. So you can port your uh, Scala 2 matrices to Scala 3, and this will allow you to use them in your Scala 3 projects. Uh, scalar reflection is not ported yet, so there is no way around it to just get rid of it. Um, Scala 2 compiler plugins would not work in Scala 3 completely. There, there are though uh, nightly builds of Scala 3 that will allow you to use compilers, but I would not recommend it. Um, so yeah, and mixing Scala 3 and Scala 2.13 independencies could not work well. Uh, this is because um, you might have a transitive dependencies, for example. Yeah, indeed, you can uh, have a project uh, to be dependent on Scala 3 libraries and Scala 2.13. They, they would work together, but uh, if they have a transitive same transitive dependencies, this will break. Um, so you should probably, uh, my recommendation is you should probably wait until all of your dependent libraries would be ported to Scala 3 or use uh, Scala 2.13 for all of the dependencies. So this is a better solution, in my opinion. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, that's, that was the last slide. Um, I wanted to tell that um, I'm really enthusiastic. I'm really curious about Scala 3. It really simplifies many things. Um, I would really love to see how, how it will work for production projects. I already uh, migrated my own library, one of my own libraries to comp cross compile for Scala 3. It took me like half an hour. So it is doable, it is possible, uh, don't be afraid. But I will uh, probably agree that we should only be migrating our uh, project to Scala 3 maybe in one year because we will see a bunch of um, patch releases. Um, I believe. Uh, last week they released uh, Scala 3.0.2. So yeah, um, I guess this is a time for Q&A. Uh, I see some messages in the chat. Uh, 